Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to panel two, Ancient Modern Technologies and Organology. Our afternoon will be very intensive and rich of new discoveries of musical instruments, sarudakis, or new interpretations of already known musical artifacts, Peru, as well as a new textual interpretation, Leitmeier, and new research projects, Lloyd. So let's start with Sylvain Perrault, archaeologist and historian by education, is a chargé de recherche au CNRS. He is the head of the Laboratoire Archimède uh, of the Micha, La Maison Interuniversitaire de Sciences de l'Homme, Alsace, and he teaches at the University of Strasbourg. Since 2012, he took part in the research project Paysage Sonore, and he was in the scientific committee of the 2017 exhibition Musique Echo de l'Antiquité. He is also a musician and president of the group uh, Ipso Facto, whose Orchestre d'Harmonie, a brass orchestra, we had the great pleasure to listen to in the last year concert of Moisa annual meeting in Strasbourg. Um, what else? A lot uh, of uh, times uh, he was in the scientific committee of uh, Moisa annual meetings. So he is a very good friend of Moisa. Today he will present the paper, Better Understanding the Argos Liars. Please. My father is a ram, and to him a tortoise bore me. When I was born, I killed both my parents. An archaeological site is like a crime scene investigation. <laughs> the experts collect clues in order to reconstruct the facts which occur in the area, trying to answer a couple of fundamental questions. Who killed whom, where, when, how, and why? Today, our crime scene is in Argos, Delimited by stones, contained a tortoise shell laid on the ground with furniture composed of sacrificial reliefs made of animal bones, notably two right horns of goat, right here on the screen, mixed with traces of combustion. The south tortoise covered a goat's jawbone and laid on a bed of ashes. The two tumuli, which are not symmetrical, are contiguous. The deposit had been surrounded and covered with shards and stones, roughly filled up and culminating in two large stones placed above the common stones. When they were exhumed, the carapaces were partly incomplete and only four scattered fragments could be found in the pit, as well as another one in a Roman embankment. So this is, uh, it was very well documented, uh, this excavation. So we have photographs of each step. This is the northern tortoise. 
here, and then under the wall here, this is the southern tortoise. And one piece, so was not found with the carapace, this is this one, but in a Roman embankment. This remain is nevertheless of particular interest because it is the only scale preserved from the left <laughs> flank of the south tortoise and it is pierced with a hole. The condition of the shells, given the closed context in which they were found, led Paul Courbin to assume that the shells were already in poor condition when they were placed in the pit and covered with their respective tumuli. Soon after, the walls of the square structure were laid on the southern tumulus. So now, the Argos shells and the history of techniques, so modern restoration and ancient technologies. The south tortoise was discovered under the south wall of the square structure, which crushed it with its weight, causing the scales to break, so that the shell was completely deformed. The restoration, which was carried out in 1978, was supposed to give the shell, if not its original shape, at least the state approaching it, by filling in the gaps with very dark wax. You see it on the screen. Paul Courbin had clearly identified the species used, the Testudo Hermani, whose name is a tribute to the great naturalist of Strasbourg, sorry, Jean mm -hmm. Hermann. The latter indeed had in his personal collection the first identified specimen of the species. Although he was not the author of the discovery, it was the idea of the naturalist of Göttingen, Johann Friedrich Gmelin, who spotted the differences that exist between the Testudo Graeca and the Testudo Hermani. He chose to give it this name in the 13th edition of Carl von Linnaeus' Systema Naturae in 1789. Great date in the French history. Small in size, about 20 centimeters long in adulthood, the Testudo Hermani is recognizable, among other things, by its horny claw at the end of the tail, the dense and extensive yellow-black patterns on the back of the shell, the two regular black bands found on the plastron, the ovoid shape of the carapace, and especially the suprocaudal scale divided into two symmetrical parts, and that's actually the only thing that you can see on the archaeological shells. The Testudo Graeca has a fused suprocaudal scale, a horny tubercle on the inner side of the thigh, large scales on the front limbs, and no horny spur at the end of the tail. Testudo hermani, testudo graeca, and testudo marginata, which is characterized by suprocaudal fan-shaped scales, are the three main European species. The 1978 restoration did not closely respect the shape and dimensions of the species, as observed during my diagnostic mission in January 13. In December 22, Aristophanes Constantatos, with the assistance of Anastasia Karamanou, made the adjustments that I had identified as necessary. First, it proved necessary to stick again some scales and consolidate them with paraloid B72 diluted in 10% acetone. That's the data of the restorers. This step done, it was necessary to shorten the length at the level of the nuncal scales by removing about one centimeter of wax. Then the periphery of the front part of the carapace was softened to avoid two marked angles. Finally, on the side where no scales are preserved, we decided to reduce the length a little and to straighten the wall a little as much as possible without endangering the integrity of the object. The wax cut was made with a hot spatula at 120 Celsius degrees. The internal reinforcement was made with fiberglass fabric bonded with 3% paraloid. Finally, external cleaning was done with pure acetone. With and I, we suggest to change the color, of course, of the wax uh, in order to exhibit in the future Museum of Argos. Several models have been used in order to approach the zoological reality of the Testudo Hermani as closely as possible. On the one hand, the tortoise shell found in the temple of Apollo Epicurios at Bassae in Arcadia, the only archaeological remain published that belongs to the same species, and on the other hand, a specimen of Testudo Hermani from the collections of the Musée Zoologique de Strasbourg, whose dimensions are comparable, about 16 centimeters long, 12 centimeters width. 
At the end of the work, the tortoise regained an appearance closer to the species to which the north tortoise also belongs. The two shells are now more homogeneous. This new examination confirmed the conclusions I, I had arrived at in 2013. The south turtle was supposed to serve as a sounding box for a liar, as the presence of holes already suggested. These are arranged in a diamond shape, one in front, one behind, and two on each side, symmetrically, although the crushing of the carapace no longer makes it appear so clearly. It can be specified that these holes were dug in a spiral, which suggests the use of a tendril. So here is, here are the holes. It is also very clear that the caudal and marginal plates have been reworked because they are not in their raw state. Small streaks confirm the use of a file. Other part is missing, however, nothing proves with certainty that it belonged to a liar in plain condition because it cannot be ruled out that it broke at the end of manufacture, and this is what I would like to demonstrate now. The comparison with the tortoise shell found in the temple of Apollo Epicurios at Basae is most enlightening. The layout of the holes is the same for three of them, the rear and side holes, but the front hole on the shell of Basae is missing. But we are in this area, and this is restored. So it could be possible that we have a hole here. I have to, I, I, I ask the, um, uh, for a new examination of the Carapace of Basai, which is now in Olympia. So I, hopefully I will see it next year for a new examination. Uh, the front of the Carapace of Basai presents another singularity holes were perforated where the string holder was to be inserted. The absence of most of the left side on the Argos uh, shell makes it impossible to verify the presence of a similar hole. On the other side, there does not seem to have been any hole, but we spot a break where it should have been. So here. We can therefore hypothesize that the shell broke where the artisan wanted to drill this hole. If we consider the whole corpus of shells pierced with holes as it was collected also by Stelios Tsarouzakis, we are struck to see that only the shells of Argos and Bassae have holes arranged in the same way, and they all belong to the species Testudo Hermani. It is therefore tempting to think that this way of doing things, for which Paul Courbin has offered an explanation that has not been disputed so far is linked with, to the species used. I only know of another specimen of Testudo Hermani adorned with bronze nails found in Muro Lecceze, and I'm thankful to Daniela who gave me more details <laughs> this morning, uh, but it's not comparable because we don't have uh, the scales with holes on the, on the shell of Muro Lecceze as I could see this morning. It does not appear that the arrangement of the holes can be attributed to any particular chronology as other carapaces of the same time show different situations. It seems to me rather that it is linked to the species, therefore both to the dimensions and the shape of the shell, more round in the case of the Testudo Hermani. Perhaps this is a mark of distinction to be made between the shells having been used to make a barbitos and those having been used to make a lion, but that's only a thought. The periphery of the north carapace, so the, uh, sorry, that was the reconstruction of Paul Courbin, of the system of uh, attachment based on the Homeric hymn to Hermes. So the periphery of the north carapace is better preserved, but it has lost all its upper scales. A flake had separated from the hole and the 1978 restoration attempted to reintegrate it, showing that it's no longer contiguous with its neighbors, with this one here. As is also the case on the lower part of the carapace, filled with about one, two millimeter of blocks. It appears that the north tortoise, which seems to have been better preserved by the immediate context than the south tortoise, there was no, ho no wall uh, above, nevertheless suffered a rather violent shock which broke the scales at this level. The interstices which remain between the scales after restoration suggest that the scales were brutally torn off. Several clues show that the north turtle was worked, but at a step before the south tortoise. The shell indeed bears tool marks, 
corresponding to sewing fi filing, but only on one side. So see here, but here it is totally raw. The, so the other side seems rather to correspond to a tearing of the breastplate than a sewing. This point is curious. One would more naturally expect the breastplate to be sewn given its thickness. By tearing off the plastron, one takes the risk of damaging the shell, which is perhaps a clue to say that this turtle, this turtle so, was not destined to become alive. Indeed, the central nuchal scale often has a small protuberance, which is filed down to harmonize the outline of the carapace. Both carapaces show traces of tools inside. So here, this is the, this area. The detail shows that you have here, working traces, traces of work. Uh, these fine and short incisions correspond on the one hand to the removal of the skeleton, which is welded to the carapace, and on the other hand to that of the plastron. This reminds us the lines of the Homeric hymn. So he turned it over and with a kizzel of gray iron, he pierced the marrow of the mountain turtle. In addition, no holes are apparent on the north shell, but this remark must be taken with caution insofar as none of the scales susceptible to being pierced, comparing to the southern tortoise, is preserved. A trace of depression um, of, at the level of a posterior scale suggests that the break occurred at the time of manufacture. So this is here, the depression. It's here on the carapace. Making it impossible to transform it into an instrument which was at a much less advanced stage than the south tortoise. It is nevertheless established that there was human activity due to the tearing of the breastplate. <coughs> so what is the, signific the signification of this deposit? Uh, the main problem in Argos is to locate actually the sanctuary of Apollo Lycaeus, who was the main deity of the city. And Patrick Marchetti, to sum up very quickly, Patrick Marchetti used uh, these findings of the two shells to locate what Posanias called the Xoana, so the statue, the old statues of Aphrodite and Hermes, saying there is one uh, tortoise for Hermes with holes and one for Aphrodite, because in Elis there is a statue, famous statue of Aphrodite, Aphrodite Urania, having he, her foot on a tortoise. Uh, so that, that was the idea of Patrick Marchetti. Marcel Pierrat, another uh, specialist of Argos, say no, it's impossible. Uh, the, the temple of Apollo Lycaeus, because, sorry, in a Posania statement, the Xoana were behind the temple of Apollo Lycaeus. So Marcel Pierrat saying it's impossible because the temple is here. And another possibility uh, by another colleague in 2008 was to locate this temple here. Actually, the problem is not the tortoises, the problem is the temple of Apollo Lycaeus. So if you relate both, uh, there is uh, the tortoises as are concerned. But my problem in that with, uh, I don't want to say that Patrick Marchetti uh, is wrong when he say that the Xoana could have been there, but in the structure, the square structure, not, but as I showed you, there is no relation between the structure and the tortoise because one of the wall was above one tortoise. So if they wanted to have a cultic continuity, they should have enclosed the tortoise, not put one wall on one tortoise. So I have another idea, and uh, Patrick Marchetti didn't know that what I'm, I was telling you about uh, the, the both carapaces. No one was used as a liar because both were broken before. So my idea is that this is an offering of an instrument maker. They broke, but he offered, nevertheless, the shells to the deity. Why? If we look at the evidence of Pausanias, who is our main source on the topography of Argos, but not only of Argos, also of Arcadia. So, that's, there was, of course, the famous legend saying that Hermes uh, invented the lyre on the Mount Silene, where he was born. But, what Pausanias said, adjoining Silene is another mountain, Chelidorea, 
Uh, and it is there, it is said that Hermes found a tortoise, took off the animal skin, and made a lyre from it. So another uh, myth about the place. Well, that's really uh, close. Here is uh, the Mont Silene, and here is the Mont Chilidorea. I use this old map of uh, Jean Barbier du Bocage, Denis, uh, Denis Barbier du Bocage, sorry, uh, famous uh, cartographer of uh, the, 19th, the early 19th century, but it is, it, it is really a reproduction of what Posanias says, so that was more useful. And that Posanias says another thing, this wood, so this is a wood of Sauron, uh, like other Arcadian groves, breeds the following beasts, wild boar, bears, and tortoises of vast size, one could of the last make lyres, not inferior to those made from the Indian tortoise. I won't discuss the possibility to make a lyre with the Indian tortoise, that's another thing. And alas, this is the, the wood of Sauron. And the last and most important statement for me is this one. Mont Parthenios rears tortoises that are particularly suitable for the making of lyres. I don't know why, but Paul Courbin said that the tortoises of Argolis were particularly beloved, but we have no text. I think he was confused with this text about Arcadian tortoises. The people who live around this mount, however, are always afraid to take them and will not allow strangers to do so either because they think that they are sacred to Pan. After having passed the summit of the mountain, there is, in a cultivated area, the boundary between the country of the Tegeates, Tegea, and that of the Argives, near Hisia in Algolis. So here, the tortoises are sacred to Pan, and we are here in Argos. So my idea is that possibly the, the species can come from this area, was considered as sacred, and the instrument maker, so anyhow, he, he didn't succeed in making the lyres, but as the animal was sacred, he consecrated the instrument, that is, so the animal. Because we have no clue on, uh, we have no, absolutely no uh, evidence of uh, deposits of tortoises for Aphrodite, nothing. We have many terracotta tort tortoises and marble tortoises, but never in Aphrodite sh shrines, it never appears. So that's only the statue of Phidias in Elis that could lead to the idea that a tortoise could have been uh, consecrated to Aphrodite. So it's never uh, checked by the evidence. So, as the other Testudo Hermani in Arcadia is, that is the Basai, because the temple of Basai is in Arcadia, that's Arcadian cult, that's why I came to this proposition that it could be rather uh, an, uh, an offering of an instrument maker, a liar maker, a liro poios, as they were called in the antiquity. Just to finish, two minutes, uh, for about this what I would call not the Lyre d'Argos, but the quasi Lyre d'Argos, the quasi liars of Argos, because they were not, sorry. But I think it's very interesting in the, to understand the process of making an instrument. I just want to show you a small video uh, showing you uh, the, um, uh, how the data related to this Argos shell was uh, implemented in the database remount. Uh, so, Repertorium Instrumentorum Antiquorum. Uh, so, the, our database, uh, our progress project, uh, ongoing project on uh, all the uh, remains of uh, music sound instruments of Egypt, Greece, and Rome. So, this is how I put uh, the data on Argos after my uh, examination. So first day, or for all the data you need, who made the file, and if uh, we have been in C2, then of course the description, you see it's a twilling wall. So you see Testudo Hermani, for example. A similar item, I made, of course, a link to the other tortoise of Argos. Then, of course, the typology, based on the Hornbostel Sachs terminology, but uh, partly uh, readapted to the ancient word. So here you have the control vocabulary, then the number on Bostel Sachs, then of course museum data, 
for Archaeological Museum of Argos, inventory number, what uh, that uh, the total was exhibited before in the museum, restorations, of course, the provenience, uh, and there is a possibility to have a link so to the map. It comes, yeah, here. So this is the granular slot. Lots of excavation, so we have, as I told you, uh, lots of information about the excavation itself. Datation, so with uh, voca uh, control vocabulary and a terminus, post -quam, terminus antequam as well. Of course, technical data, lengths, width, and so on. Not weight, because with the wax, it, it makes no sense to have the weight of the carapace. And the publication here. And if you click on uh, this, you have all the information you need about the publication. So it was in the Bulletin de Correspondance Hellenique Supplément 6, dedicated to Argos and attention. And I hope I found a solution to our crime scene investigation. Thank you. May I call here Florian, Florian Lightmeyer, please. Yeah, thank you. Florian is, uh, okay. Florian is uh, academic senior advisor at Julius Maximilian's Universität Würzburg, where he collaborates uh, with the chair of classical archaeology. He organized the exhibition Music On, Clang der Antique, 2019-2020, in Mar Martin von Wagner Museum, which catalog is in open access, so everyone can look at it. His research projects consider both the visual aspects of ancient musical heritage as well as the textual ones. For example, among his publications, locusts, grasshoppers, and cicadas as muses, different ways of visualizing insect music in antiquity in Greek music, music uh, and uh, Roman musical studies, 2017. Today, Florian is going to share with us the paper, Searching for Small Trumpets, a critical comment on Seneca Epistule 56.4. Okay, can you hear me? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, now can you hear me? Good. Better. Um, Donatella, thank you very much for the, the introduction. Let's start. Um, again, thank you very much for the introduction and uh, thank you for being part of the Moisa conference uh, here. I would like to present you um, some ideas that came into my mind uh, reading again the famous uh, um, epistle of, of Seneca. Um, which I will give you the impression of the first uh, um, two or three paragraphs um, first. Imagine what a variety of noises reverberates about my ears. I have lodgings right over bathing establishment. So picture to yourself the assortment of sounds which are strong enough to make me hate my very powers of hearing. When your strenuous gentleman, for example, is exercising himself by flourishing lean weights, when he is working hard or else pretends to be working hard, I can hear him grunt. And whenever he releases his imprisoned breath, I can hear him panting in wheezy and high-pitched tones. Or perhaps I notice some lazy fellow content with the cheap rub down and hear the crack of the pummeling hand on his shoulder, varying in sound according as the hand is laid on a flat or hollow. Then perhaps a professional comes along shouting out the score that is the finishing touch. Add to this 
the arresting of an occasional roisterer or pickpocket, the racket of the man who always likes to hear his own voice in the bathroom, or the enthusiast who plunges into the swimming tank with unconscious neville noise and splashing. Besides all those vo uh, whose voices, if nothing else, are good, imagine the hair plucker when he, with his penetrating shrill voice for purposes of advertisement, continually giving it vent and never holding his tongue, expect when he's plucking the armpits and making his victim yell instead. Then the cake seller with his uh, varied cries, the sausage man, the confectioner, and all the vendors of food hawking their wares, each with his own distinctive intonation. Words seem to distract me more than noises, for words demand attention, but noises merely fill the ears and beat upon them. Among the sounds that then around me uh, without distracting, I include passing carriages, a machinist in the same block, a saw sharpener nearby, or some fellow who is demonstrating with little pipes and flutes at the trickling fountain, shouting rather than singing. In this famous letter from Seneca to, to Lucilius, the beginning of which we have just heard, the philosopher reports on the noisy hustle and bustle of Baye and Rome that surrounds him on all sides. It is from this atmospheric background noise that I would like to examine this phrase, this phrase, uh, the last phrase today. And um, my intention was to uh, give you the, the atmosphere that Seneca wants to create. And uh, you um, may maybe realize that that is always the voice um, in the foreground and, and only at the end he's talking about um, instruments. And so I um, want to discuss uh, now this uh, um, sentence, Hunc qui ad metam sudantem tubulas expeditur et tibias nec cantat set ex that exclamat, which was translated um, of Gumere in the uh, Latin classical library, in the Lüb, in the Lüb classical library, to some fellow who is the demonstrating with little pipes and flutes at the trickling fountain, shouting rather than singing. If one compares uh, the original with the translation, it is of course not only the flutes that stand out, an inaccuracy that one repeatedly encounters, but which can easily be replaced as tibia. The trickling fountain also needs no translation, of course, since it, since it is the name of the Meta Sudans fountain in Rome. But what is hidden behind tubulas, which is only known in Latin literature by Seneca, and as far as I know has no epigraphic equivalent? Are they really pipes? And with this tubulas, um, there's uh, another difficulty um, because uh, we have here a conjecture. Gruterus um, in the 16th century um, has uh, um, uh, conjected uh, tabulas to tubulas, and that makes more sense uh, in his opinion. Um, in my search for the meaning of this vocabulary, I received helpful support from the Latinist Tobias Denzer, who assisted me as classical archaeologist with answering my philological questions. Thus, my following considerations are guided from an archaeological perspective, and I'm already very grateful for philological advice of any kind, and I think this is uh, the best place um, to get good advice from. In order to be able to classify the text accordingly, I turn first to tubulas, then to the verb experiri, and finally to the setting ad meta sudante. After a final consideration of the context, I will try, out, um, I will try to come to an interpretation of the passage. The singular word tubulas, um, translated as small trumpets, uh, small tube, um, goes back to a conjecture by Gruterus, who corrected the traditional tabulas with it. If the letter also appear again in research, there's a third variant, um, the form tubulos. Um, let's start with the reading tabulas um, uh, in the history of tradition. James May suggested this some time ago 
um, to go, go back to the reading of tabulas. He associates it with the tibias and wants to reconstruct an organ tuner in a whole scene who had set up his hydraulis next to the well. As evidence, he first sees practical reasons. We have water at the fountain, and we have, uh, we, he, uh, think, uh, he needs water for the hydraulis, as well as the reference to Vitruvius. And uh, you see here um, the part of Vitruvius where uh, tabula uh, um, uh, is, is mentioned for the hydraulis, and the, the Greek expression tabula greke pinax dikitur. The connection with water is then also the subject of the second reading as tubulos. Walter C. Summers, in particular, sought this reading in order to escape the singularity and establish the connection to the well as a water pipe. The term is indeed connected with water pipes. For example, in the water protection law of Quinctius, you see here um, the, the uh, passage um, uh, which is um, uh, which should be found uh, in the work of Frontinus. Um, this text, today unintentionally up to date, deals with matter, de deals with with measures to be taken when public water is taken uh, without permission. He then mentions different names for water pipes, which, apart from the more common fistula, also include um, tubuli. Uh, you see here fistulas, tubulos, and you see also um, in the, in the uh, translation, and all the English translation I've uh, t taken from the Loeb library, um, uh, there's pipes of any size. They um, didn't mean fistulas and tubulos, they, they only talk of pipes of any size. In our context, therefore, it um, would be a person who is in the protest of checking the water pipes of the well, making appropriate noises. The third, oh, oops. The, the third widely accepted option, according to the communist opinion, is the tubulas. This can then be understood as a diminutive form of the tuba with which, and the tibia, the person then produces noise. What is problematic about this is not only the singular uh, Latin designation by Seneca, but also the fact that the term is not only unique in ancient literature, but we also do not know any small tube um, as an archaeological remain. Let's come to the verb experiri. While the different ways of reading may still be juxtaposed, it seems to me that the verb experiri is already decisive. Experiri initially means to find out something in the sense to, of to examine or to try out. This already seems to speak against the organ tuner, since it is rather a matter of trying things out. In addition, it seems rather unlikely to me that an organist would tune his instrument only because of the proximity of water on the street. Since he would certainly play it at another place and the transport of the water flask is impractical. In my opinion, the connection of the verb with experiri, which means to try or to try out, speaks against the first reading. Moreover, the connection with the metasudans would not really be comprehensible because why would an organist stand in the street and try out his instrument? Experiri also seems to me to be a knockout criterion for the second solution. While trying out, testing, or repairing the water pipes is quite conceivable, the combination with tibia is very unusual. The latter could also be tubes in water pipes, but other terms such as fistula are more common here. And even if this were the case, the scene would be the following. A technician blows into different water pipes making a deafening noise. Now, in the case of well installation, there's still water in the rises. Even if the well were not yet connected, the water level cannot be as high as would be appropriate for Seneca's scenery. Also, 
Considering the appearance of X periodi elsewhere in the poetry, the third reading seems more likely. The third reading as tubulars. Thus, X periodi, as you can see um, uh, on the presentation, appears in Virgil's fifth eclogue and Calpurnius Siculus fourth eclogue. The connection here is always that a new or novel instrument is to be tried out, which is also a wind instrument, probably a syrinx. For not only have the gods given to you to tell husbandmen of coming rainstorms and um, of the kind of sunrise of golden sunset offers, but you are often the singer of sweet poetry, and now the muse rewards you with bacchic ivy clusters. Now fair Apollo shades your brow with laurel. But if you would show favor to my nervous attempts, perhaps I might make trial of those reeds, which skillful uh, Eolas presented to me yesterday with the words, this pipe wins over savage poles and makes sweetest melody to your own founders. In once is owned by Titurus, who among these hills of yours was the first to sing his tuneful lay on a Hyblaean pipe. And uh, the Bergil version, uh, I think uh, um, you can read, uh, and uh, there's uh, a dialogue between um, Mopsus and another p person, and Mopsus said, no, I will try these words, which the other day I carved on a green beach bark and set to music, making words and tune in turn. Then you can bid Amyntas compete with me. The decision in favor of the trumpets, the small trumpets, is ultimately supported by the reference um, to the Meta Sudans, which is the actual place where this uh, takes place. The Meta Sudans, sometimes translated as sweating column, is a large fountain with a round structure formed by a meta. It is the conical pillar. Um, it should only be noted in passing that Seneca is the first to transmit, to transmit this designation. The construction of uh, uh, Amita Sudans has been preserved in Rome, but it remains were destroyed during the reconstruction of the city under Mussolini. Only the foundation was still visible in the ground. And if you're now in Rome, you can see the foundation of the Meta Sudan, of the Meta Sudans uh, near the Arch of Constantine, the Palatine, and on the other side, uh, the um, huge Amphitheatrum Flavium. And there uh, you can see the, the rest uh, of the Meta Sudans. Um, it wasn't always so. Uh, you see here a picture of, um, taken before 1936, before this, this uh, huge project um, of Mussolini to, um, in Rome. You see here the rest of the Meta Sudans uh, in a photograph taken about 1920. And you see also that, that the Meta Sudans uh, was uh, um, uh, nearly always visible um, in this sketch that uh, was made be before 1680. And you see the close connection to the Arch of Constantine. And you see also the forum with the Arch of Titus uh, here on that uh, part. We know uh, quite a lot of its superstructure from coin depictions, which, however, show the condition of the Flavian period of Meta Sudans. There you can see uh, two coins, um, uh, two sesterces um, minted during the reign of Titus. You see here the Meta Sudans, and you see a single piece with the Meta Sudans. Uh, now in the British Museum, and, and this uh, piece is very interesting, but, but it, uh, because it uh, seems to be reworked in later times. Uh, maybe you notice that you, you have here these two lines that it's, uh, seems that have, uh, it's a fountain with two heads, like a sparkling fountain, um, but uh, in antiquity it seems more to be uh, a fountain where the water rinses out and, and uh, uh, flow down uh, the pillar so that the expression of a, a sweating stone, a sweating column is, is uh, more 
reasonable. Um, the Meta Sudans is uh, only a nearly singular piece. We um, don't have many pieces of the Meta uh, of that kind of uh, fountain. We have one um, in the North African Jemila, the Roman Kuikul, uh, uh, one fountain we can date to the Severan period. Recent excavation have shown, however, that underneath there are already the remains, um, that, that underneath the Flavian structure, there are already the remains of an Augustan structure, which in turn fell victim to the fire in the Neronian times and was built over by the Domus Aurea. On the basis of this find, however, we can assume that Seneca is in Rome and do not have to reconstruct a meta in Baye um, out of thin air, as is repeatedly suggested for the letter um, of Seneca. Um, and uh, this is very striking. I show you here um, a plan of Rome that you can, can localize. Uh, we are here in this region. And uh, it's very interesting um, when we locate here the Meta Sudans um, in the period of Augustus, be because um, as you uh, uh, know, um, Augustus reorganized the, the organization of the city. He made out of uh, four um, uh, areas, 14 areas, and the Meta Suda is, um, is located at a cross point of uh, four or maybe five uh, um, districts in the new organized city of Augustus. So, um, here in red you see the structures uh, we can uh, now uh, realize um, before uh, the uh, huge fire in Rome, before 64, and you see it's um, very close to the Flavian structure, as you see here um, in gray, and here are the Augustan structure, and uh, now this uh, um, environment near the Meta Surans is, is now um, very um, important. Only a few components of the Augustan Meta have survived, which led to this reconstruction in analogy to other Meta in uh, the circus, etc. So, um, uh, you see here the start of, of um, the excavation um, in 2001, and uh, if you look down, we have, we have this circle. You can uh, find here the Augustan uh, meter Sudans, and here see a kind of, of the um, Augustan street. What is most informative for our question, however, is the, is the structural surroundings of the Meta. First of all, the Meta marks a crossroad of several roads and regions in Rome, which Augustus is known to have, be, to have reorganized. As a traffic junction, the background noise at this point may not have been insignificant. In the vicinity, several late Republican and early Imperial Domus built over by the Amphitheatrum Flavium and the Domus Aurea, as well as the Templum Veneris at Rome, have been found, which suggests that Seneca himself may have lived here. On the other hand, a sacred area was located here, with a temple in front of which an exeter was erected with a statue dedication for the imperial house. And uh, you see here the temple and here a small exeter, and you see here um, a huge statue base, uh, and, and here they placed another statue base. The Enatores, Tubicines, Litikines, and Cornicines appear here as dedicators. Since the dedication was always updated from 12 BC until the burning of Rome, we can speak here uh, certainly of a concerted dedication. Also, the collegia in other places also appear individually. A common installation makes this place a unifying and integrating one in any case. Um, we have here all the collegia and, and, and you can read the inscription and, and uh, see how important uh, it was for them to, be, uh, to get 
realized as, uh, um, or to want to be read as dedicators. Um, the letters are a little bit, uh, are even a little bit um, uh, greater than uh, the letters um, of the Caesar. We know also, oh, we know also other collegia and the Collegio Tibicinum at Fidicinum that is uh, very close to the Meta Sudans uh, and, and we know that the dedication and uh, um, uh, we, we know of the Collegium Tibicinum, another dedication which has been found close to the Arch of Constantine. Ah, and there's uh, another very important dedication for, for epigraphical reasons because uh, the inscription is uh, here not set on stone, it's set on a bronze plaque um, which is very rare. We, we only know uh, five or six of these pieces mainly from uh, Spain and uh, this is very important uh, and, and uh, you see here the reconstruction of, of the um, parts we have still found and you see if, um, the uh, dedicators the uh, Enatores, Tubicines, Titicines and Cornicines in this statue base for Tiberius. It is therefore probable that this sacred area was rather the location of the cult musicians association, especially since Beate Bollmann was able to point out the structural connection between the cult location and the temple in her work on the Roman Collegia. The excavators instead um, refer to the complex, uh, show again the complex, to the complex here as Curia Veteres, and as an uh, institution that is said to go back to Romulus himself and the idea which is uh, um, very prominent in Italian archaeology uh, or in especially Roman archaeology of the Roma Quadrata that you can see in the Roman the topography of Rome still um, the idea of founding Rome um, by, um, by, by the hero Romulus. Last but not least, only in the last few days I've come across um, objects found in this area, according to the excavators, the Curia Veteris. These are objects that survived the fire of Rome, which was active at this spot for a particularly long time. And you see uh, it, uh, here the great fire of uh, Rome under Nero uh, lasts uh, nine days. And you see here, uh, the part was were strongly addicted by the fire and, and we are um, here. Um, and um, the, there was the great fire for um, more than five or six uh, days. It can be seen clearly from the melted grate. Uh, we see here a grate, a closed uh, um, window, uh, which we could reconstruct here as a great and the two objects, or maybe the one object I found in a pu publication were these uh, um, two ones. And uh, for me, it seems, um, uh, uh, and they were descriptive as hollow, they were descriptive as tubes in the, um, by the excavators. And for me, it seems that, that, that they could be a tuba. I don't know. I, I haven't seen them and in the final publication until uh, edited, um, but uh, maybe uh, we could here find another tuba and one tuba uh, who we could connect uh, to, the, um, to the building and, and of the tubicines. But even without the discovery of a tuba, the evidence is now so strong that the Seneca passage has been decided in favor of the tubulas. So, in conclusion, we can still ask our, ourselves whether we are getting any further with the question of what, is, of what is being played here. Certainly, the scenery within the letter serves to indicate the usual musical noisy goings on at this traffic junction. Thomas Planck also recently referred here to the famous passage in the Apocolocynthesis, which speaks of the trumpet noise of, a pompa, of the Pompa Funebris on the Via Sacra, which runs in the immediate vicinity here. Here it says, 
While they were going down by the way of the Via Sacra, Mercury inquired um, about the meaning of the great crowd. Was it Claudia's funeral? And it was the most gorgeous spectacle, with no expense spared, so that you clearly knew a god was being buried. There was such a mob of trumpet players and horn players um, and every kind of brass instrumentalists that uh, even Claudius could hear it. Finally, if one asks what this musician uh, is doing here and how the connection to the tibia can be recognized, Thomas Planck again referred to the tubilustrium. Um, it is the occasion of the ritual purification of the instruments. According to Rübke, this event took place in the middle of every month and could therefore have coincided with the Quinquatrus Minoris cult festival in mid-June, when the Tibicines celebrated the founding of their association. Whether Seneca wanted to refer to this cultic connection of the two instruments, however, cannot be said with certainty. The Quinquatrus Majoris of the Enatoris was associated with the Tubilustrium, but this is probably not entirely correct. Thus, um, we would also have a connection between the two instruments in the cultic field. If we then consult Obitz Fasti, we learn that Apollo plays a role here as well as Athena. And Apollo, in turn, is closely linked to the Augustan cult program. And again, with the Metasudans, to be understood in the sense of a cult pillar, we find the form uh, on the Campana reliefs on the Palatine on which Apollo, in turn, has hung his kitera. But this leads to another chapter. I now come to the conclusion. We have seen that the reading tubulas and thus also interpretation um, in terms of small trumpets is further supported by the inclusion of the archaeological context. In addition, the attribution of a collegium area here seems very likely to me, whereby we can then recognize a specific sound spot here. Thank you. So, uh, we thank you again, Florian, and uh, I call, it's good for Stelios now? Okay, so, we come back to Stelios now, maybe. Please, Stelios. Hi, Evita. Yes, of course, yes. And no, <laughs> it happens every time. So I'm so glad to, to, to listen to your voice, which in a few seconds will speak about a little Kelis from Corinthos. Please, Stelios. Good afternoon, everybody. And, uh, Donatella and all the other dear colleagues, and thank you very much for inviting me to the conference once again. And I'm speaking to you from Athens, and I'm sorry that not to have been able to be with you in person, but life sometimes decides otherwise. Uh, looking forward both to meeting you all again next time. And my day today, as you said, is entitled A Little Careless from Coyote. Yeah. It worked. So during rescue excavations in 2000. Let's start again, please. A little hands from Corinthos. During rescue excavations in 2011 along the highway from modern Corinthos to Tata, along the so called Olympia Podos. You can see the red dot here where the excavations took place. During rescue excavations in 2011, along the highway from modern Corinthos all the way to Padra, along the Olympia of us, as it is called, you see this red dot here, five graves were on earth, apparently belonging to an organized cemetery, but possibly to a family of 
the late arcade period, that is mid 6th century to early 5th century BC, having on either side of them Mycenaean installations. About 100 meters to the west, part of the cemetery was discovered, presumably a continuation of the so called North Cemetery of Polyphos, excavated by the American School of Classical Studies in the previous century. You can see uh, a blue uh, a tower here, which is the focus of our interest today. In grade 160, what the blue arrow is, inside a stone sarcophagus, followed by a slab, archaeologist Basilius Tassinos of the Corinthos effort of prehistoric and classical antiquities of Greece, found, together with a number of other offerings to the deceased, such as a Hydria, a Skiphos, two Lepitoi, a Stringis, a Stringis, some Astragaloi, and a Grafis, <coughs> parts of a small sized third, third fold of Scarabus, the one that we know as Helios. With its shell partially preserved and its iron string holder complete and its initial position on the carapace. There it is, you can see the front of the string holder. Therefore, leaving no doubt that the carapace served as a liar resident. No other parts of the instrument were recovered. No arms, or yoke, or strings, or tuning mechanisms, or skin soundboard, or bridge, or plectrum board, or wristband, or interior elements if there were any. The burial has been dated to the first quarter of the 5th century BC, so that's between 500 and 475 BC, making the present Helis one of the earliest retrieved thus far. The instrument lay face down beside the right side of the deceased, with the lost mouth yoked towards the head. <coughs> the skeleton, with a skull in the east, has been thought of as belonging to another male. The archaeologist bases this interpretation uh, on the iconography on, of the one of the legatory where a warrior scene is being portrayed, not a likely candidate for a female person. The restoration, the finding, was restored by Master Angeliki Zisi and the following steps were carried out in order to clean and consolidate it. So here comes some new tech. The top part soil that had adhered to the surface of the carapace was removed by a scalpel. The even part of the substratum was then lightly wetted using a cotton poultice soaked in a solution of ethanol in distilled water, 50 to 50 by weight, the loosened soil was wiped, uh, wiped away with cotton buds after a few minutes. A third layer of even harder insoluble uh, salts, already softened by the previously applied solution, was chipped away using an ultrasonic scalpel. The metallic part, the metallic part was cleaned by gentle sand blasting with glass beads of 40 to 80 micrometer, and although, although it was microscopically assessed that a lot of the original metal iron had been corroded away, the original shape of the iron had been preserved. There was no active metal corrosion present, that is, no sign of orange color corrosion product, which we know as brass. Following the cleaning process, both carapace and string holder were consolidated with a solution of paraloid D72 in acetone, 5% by weight. Two main carapace pieces and six of the detached carapace plaques were subsequently glued together with HMG paraloid 72 glue and internally, small pieces of a special thin weaved light-weighted fabric were, were used in order to reinforce the thin joints of the attached plugs. You can see them here, this uh, thin material. 
male and overhead where the joints are. These fabric pieces were further consolidated by a solution of paralloid P72 elastophone, 5% lightweight, and in order to further secure the heavy part of the carapace, carrying the thin holder to the larger part of the shell, a stronger glue was used in the area near that joint here, thereabouts. Um, the, if I can pronounce this, the cyanoacrylate glue, commonly known as super glue. The restored instrument is now on exhibit in the Archaeological Museum of Ancient Corinthians under the code number MIKAPA 9362. A comparison uh, with the modern Escudo Marginata carapus shows that all the central plugs of the dome survive. Capital A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, K, J. From top of string code. However, the central tail end side plug zero, oh, uh, this one, is missing, making it difficult for us to decide with certainty whether the individual belongs to the Marginata, Greca, or Hermione species of Vescuso, the three types of tortoise living in the country. The asterisks that you see here on B and C are employed in this particular case to indicate the curious feature of this particular shell. You can see the, the, uh, the top cute line, the skewed line, this one, crosses B rather than C, which is the usual case of lyre characteristics, probably because the animal was young and its shell had not yet developed further towards the tail, pushing C under the skewed line, uh, unless, of course, we have here an idiosyncratic natural design, which is not impossible. Uh, however, the same feature is present in the small lion carapace from Vasai, this one, um, which is of capital size, that is 15 by 12 centimeter. The skewed line, this one, which is the same with that one, also crosses plug B rather than C. Now, having heard some of that, uh, it crosses my mind that it could be a feature of the Hermione the type of shell, but I have to check that. An examination of the right side of the carapace and a comparison with the same model shell reveals two things. A, that all lateral plugs, plug, small a, b, c, d, e, f, g, h, have survived, and B, that only five out of eleven side plugs have been retrieved. Number 5, 6, 7, 10, and 11. Uh, on the other side, a number of the lateral plugs have lost some of their edge material, such as C and D, and then again F and G, while all side plugs, all of these plugs which you can see on the modern carapace, are missing, have perished. Same. For a small part of 11, you can just see down here, 11, uh, through which passes the left prong of the string holder. There are two sets of holes observed on the lower part of the carapace. One set for the fixation of the string holder, there and there. And a set a little higher, there and this one, situated at the extreme lateral borders of plug J. The whole thing is one whole plug J. This is a skewed line. Uh, holes which undoubtedly receive the low ends of the now perished wooden arms, like uh, the, 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 end, the endings of the arms uh, nesting into these two holes. Other than these two sets of holes, there are no other holes drilled into the carapace. Uh, as is often the case with, with uh, uh, other liar finds, and here there are uh, 18 of those that you see are filled with little holes. Um, one would think that this lack of small holes over the dome of the carapace 
might be explained by the small size of the shell, which is only 15 and a half by uh, 10 and a half centimeter in, uh, across the dome. And uh, had we not possessed the Basai sound box, this one again, which is a little smaller than the present Oryphus one, just about a centimeter smaller, and which, apart from an extra set of small holes on the sides, this one and that one, seems to have a separate hole in its upper area, this one as well. Perhaps the maker of the Corypheus lyre did not think there was need for extra fastening of the arm system onto the shell. This was presumably the function of the least small diameter hole drilled on the surface of the carapace to secure the, the wooden frame onto the sound box. String holder is made of iron, as can easily be appreciated by the characteristic way in which the metal was corroded. As has already been said, despite the local deformations caused by the oxidizing process, the iron preserves its original form, <coughs> that of a pie, a pie, okay, with curved prongs into the lower part of the characters. The length of the straight part from there to there, upon which the strings have been tied, is five and a half centimeter, and its diameter at the narrowest point is 6.3 millimeter. The legs of the pie, and by legs I mean these two parts, the legs are about two centimeter, and the, the diameter, the, 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 the diameter is 4.46. Uh, the length of the next part, and by that I mean this part, okay, of the uh, spring holder, is uh, 2.1 to 2 centimeter, and the prongs extend beyond the internal wall of the shell by about 4 centimeters. Uh, now, the distance between the adjacent edges of the holes which receive the prongs is 3.51, which means that from there to there we measure 3.1, unless we prefer to measure from the center of this hole to the center of that hole, which makes the reading 4.1 centimeter. The diameters of the prongs at the holes, there and there, are both measured to be 5 millimeters. The graphite-like object found in the burial came from quite a distance away from the lyre. It lay between the legs of the deceased, a strong indication that it was not part of the instrument, but indeed a writing utensil, a real graphite, and not part of the tuning mechanism of the instrument. Now, to draw my conclusion, all in all, this point was curious is the third very small exemplar of small sized instruments, the second being that of Basque, and the third one found in Athens, which is awaiting its publication soon. It would be a fair question to ask why such a small lion was placed inside the grave of an adult male. We don't know the exact age of the deceased, as the skeleton is currently under study by an Thus far, no information on age has been disclosed. So, there is more to learn in the near future. And before I conclude, I would like to express my thanks and appreciation to archaeologist uh, Mas Panagiotti Cassini, the director of the Corinthus Effort, for granting me permission to study the find. Archaeologist Mr. Vasilios Cassinos, excavator of the lyre, for consenting to my application to study and publication of the instrument, his warm reception in the laboratory of the Museum of National Corinthus, and his willingness to share with me relevant information and photographs. Also to the restorator and the TCC for providing me with all the relevant information and photographs on the restoration process fine, and the conservator, Mrs. Professor Kumbula, have helped with practical matters during my visit to the laboratory of the museum. 
And lastly, professors Konstantinos Kislas for sending me a preliminary report on his own, of his own, uh, on the Liar in Antikadelis of May 12 of 2018, and Professor Gabriel Zufriedel for pointing out to me the existence of the find in the first place. And of course, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Stelios, for this uh, new musical instrument which uh, you brought to our attention with uh, such huge uh, details of uh, description. Thank you so much. So, if there is any questions, please. Maybe we can uh, see again the table of uh, all the Kelis. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Such a comparative uh, table is very useful. Yeah, yes, I know. Yeah. 18, yeah. Yeah. And uh, there are two from Ambrechia, one from Argos, the one that was described by Sylvain earlier. Um, but now we have a, a, a new idea about it. The Daphne one that was found, most of them are large uh, characters. Dinos, Ephesus, uh, two in Lecce, and we see it there, mm. and lots in Lothrotten, lots from in Lothry, South Italy. Mm. So this, this has to be expanded now. Yeah. Are they disposed in alphabetical order now? But uh, <clears throat> in, uh, uh, um, in great, uh, as great as are, they are, uh, you told us that this one, the Corinthos one, is uh, a small, one of the yes. smallest ones. And uh, this is uh, very interesting, and also the questions which uh, you, you asked uh, yourself and uh, us, uh, 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 there is any relationship between uh, adult, uh, male, and uh, small uh, musical instruments. We, we didn't uh, have any, any, how can I say, any hints at the moment of this kind of questions, but uh, we are also waiting for uh, uh, anthropological analysis on uh, the skeleton, yeah. Yes, yes, this is a relatively new uh, thing, so yeah. it's back to 2011, which is relatively new, and the material is now being studied by, by everybody in college. Soon, I hope we shall have more results from yeah. the analysis. Yeah. Thank you. There is Barnaby who has got a question for you. Thank you for such wonderful detail and photographs. I'm intrigued by the prongs and the function of that length inside, given that there are also two holes that you very reasonably suggest are to fasten the arms. So my practical question uh, is what do those prongs attach to? I don't think they're attached to anything. They are embedded into the catapus. The, the holes are drilled into the catapus and then this system goes into it through the holes and stays there. And as the strings, as the strings pull upwards, this uh, this item, this this pie-shaped thing, they pull it upwards, uh, these prongs push backwards onto the shell, and therefore there is there, there is no um, danger for the for the system to become dislocated in any way. So you don't have to glue them or to glue the, the iron onto the carapace. Uh, it's simply 
jams into the, into the calculus, I think. This is my own view. Thank you. And in my reconstruction of my own life, this is the way I did it. I simply uh, put the come, prompts come, come through the holes and they stay there ever after. There is a, another question, one uh, by Stefan and one by James, but I call James here because he is the last one of our session. Yes, please. Still, as you raised the question of the small carapace in an adult's grave, and you must have entertained the possibility that the small carapace means the long-armed liar we, call, we normally term a barbitos, as opposed to the larger carapace for the smaller armed liar, known as a lyra, and you would rather expect a lyra being given to a young man and the barbitos to somebody experienced in symposium or commerce related merrymaking. But you did not mention this. Why didn't you? <laughs> well, uh, I, I always thought that the barbitos had a large carapace. And that, uh, that um, in iconography we see the characters as small because there is not much space and, and because the arms of the body are long. And in, and in order to, for the painter to show the, the actual length of the magnitude of the instrument, they, they design, they, they draw the characters as small in relation to the arms. So we get the idea today that the barbicos used a small uh, shell. But on the other side, if you have long strings, which means a uh, relatively base instrument, then you would have a, a large sound, sound box, isn't it? So, uh, a large sound box to sustain the, the larger sound of the long strings. <laughs> That's why I didn't connect the little canvas with the barbicos. Okay, yes. Stefan is thinking about. Well, um, one would think so, but on the other hand, I think there are lutes which have relatively small sound boxes and still relatively long strings, such as types of uh, barbat or so. So I don't think it's necessarily connected. And you can have good sound of bass mm. notes even mm. with small sound boxes. Okay. Mm. Yes, yes, you've got a point there. OK. Again. Yeah. And uh, now another question by um, James Lloyd, who is at the table now. Yeah. Um, th thanks so much, Selios. Um, I, I wonder what you think. <laughs> um, the thinking about the two instruments of ancient Greece, the aulos and the lyre, with the aulos there's been a fair amount of work done arguing for, from a relatively early point, a certain amount of consistency, which is surprising in terms of, you know, um, a difference of a third between some of these early archaic and classical alloys in terms of their relative pitches as reconstructed. Mm -hmm. Uh, and in terms of how they're made, the shocking similarity between Poseidonia and Pydna. Yet when we look at the, the, the tortoise shells of liars, they seem to be very idiosyncratic and very, very uh, different in terms of where the holes go. Uh, yeah. do, what, what do you make of that? <laughs> uh, well, a very open-ended uh, question, sorry. <laughs> yeah, well, you, you use the word idiosyncratic. I think, um, they were not mass produced the way things are produced these days. They were made individually by different uh, makers. Uh, perhaps the characters were not all the same. Uh, perhaps the, the makers felt that they needed uh, stronger connections between uh, more robust instruments, better connections between the, uh, the frame frame and the sound box. Um, uh, unless also, also the idea that, the, uh, that some of these lies might have been broken in antiquity and they were explored somehow and therefore new, new holes were opened for the purpose. Um, because uh, instruments get, get broken and uh, 
we take them to the specialists who lament them, don't we? Yeah, yeah. That, some yeah. some characters, one from Lockley, for example, is very, very long. Is much, much longer than it is wide, than its width, and therefore perhaps more passing points were required for strengthening the connection between the wooden frame and the sound box. But other than that, I have no other idea. Thank you. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, I, I think the idea of um, repairing gels quite nicely with, I've, I've recently looked at the bottoms of the wooden arms of the Elgin Lyre and there's some very odd things there that could be explained by repairing. Um, and perhaps uh, original unsuccessful drilling, hmm. which for them may realise that they drilled the hole in the wrong place, but then they made another one. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it's further down. Yeah. Thank you. So, thank you so much again, Stelios, and stay with us. Okay, we go on with uh, our James Thomas Lloyd, PhD Classics, uh, is Marie Curie. Fellow in the Austrian Academy of, uh, you know, of Sciences in Vienna, with uh, he works with, actually with uh, Stefan Nagel. His research focuses on the intersections of tangible and intangible cultural phenomena in the ancient world, particularly votive and musical dedication, and their cross-cultural networks. Among his publications uh, in um, open access, the Spartan lead votives, new data from archival and scientific analysis 2021, and music and materiality, I like uh, to quote this one, in Greek and Roman musical studies 2020, uh, because it's a topic on which he organized uh, the 2018 Moise annual meeting in Reading. So we are at the end of our session, where in the deep material, uh, tangible musical heritage, and uh, James' paper title is Musical Technologies in the Archaic Mediterranean. Um, many thanks uh, for that kind introduction, Donatella. Um, yeah, so uh, my background, I guess, is a, a PhD in the music of ancient Sparta, and in Spartan archaeology and material culture. Um, but the work I'm presenting today is part of the Mary Curie Individual Fellowship Project, Mike AGM, Musical Identities Exchange, or well, you can read it up there. Um, it's a two-year project, and I'm halfway through it. Um, the project focuses, um, oh, this is an overview of how today's gonna go, hopefully. Um, the project focuses um, on the social complexities of music in the archaic Greek period, and thinking about regional, um, about different approaches to studying the impact of music on the formation of local, regional, and other identities across broad uh, geographical regions. Um, today, um, I will focus mainly on alloy, and Stefan Hagel has kindly printed off um, a 3D print, which I'm as of uh, the Ephesus pipe in the, the British Museum, which I'll talk about briefly. Um, the, more broadly, the first year of the project has included a, a study of the iconography of music in Lacedaemonian, Clasimonian, and Boeotian uh, black figure pottery, a study of the Elgin lyre, um, looking at the, the wooden arms of it off the display case, and there's some interesting things there. Um, Egyptian pipes in the British Museum, a study of the Reading Aulos, including PXRF, so we have a better idea of the metals made on that. Uh, that was with Pete Bray, an expert on Roman metals. Um, and year two will include visits to museums in Greece uh, and hopefully Istanbul and studies of Corinthian and Attic pottery. So this is just to give you a broad idea of, of what I'm working on. Uh, and yeah, today's going to be on Aulos. Um, this is the, the Reading Aulos, not archaic, but interesting. Uh, and, and some kind of things that's going to be happening from the project. Um, so despite being born in Birmingham uh, and going to school over the road <laughs> from the university there, um, I only ever met Andrew Barker once uh, at his Martin West Memorial Lecture in 2017 on the topic of migrating musical myths, the case of the Libyan Aulos. Uh, and it would be fair to say that this talk was something of a catalyst for me starting to think 
about issues of musical and material exchange uh, and topics that I'll be talking about today. Um, but before returning to the alloy, um, I think it would be worthwhile um, situating some previous approaches. Um, this is something that I, I start a, a lot of talks with, um, Stefan's quotation about the need to move away from this idea of primitivism when we think about the development of our loss technology and, and the technology involved in it, um, the support for that from um, pseudo Plutarch's De Musica. Nonetheless, the overall narrative that we get from the De, Mus uh, De Musica is one from very basic primal origins uh, through these levels of advancements. Um, and we, how much did they really know about what was happening in the seventh century BCE is the question that comes from that. Um, we know that writers such as Pindar were very interested in engaging in their musical past. Um, Franklin's written about that. But the extreme side of things is that we end up with these very odd biographical details also being found, such as the pseudo entry for Simonides saying that he invented the third string, which makes no sense at all. <laughs> um, so uh, th there's some caution that needs to be applied there. Um, so I, I, I think this has meant that the foregrounding of textual evidence has perhaps led us to some slightly odd conclusions about what music was like in the archaic period. These are some uh, just qu quotations. Ustinova's most recent article in the Journal of Hellenic Studies is very interesting, but I think the conclusion that she comes to is flawed by its lack of uh, attention to material evidence, such as Sam Holtzman's article on, on the, the liars from Phrygia. Um, that's, of course, to say that there are some very good takes as well. Um, <laughs> uh, this is not to say that I agree with all of the points made in the articles that I've got highlighted up here, but there, there is a difference between how the archaic music is approached by, say, the in-group of people at Moisa and Isgma and the people who approach archaic Greek music from different kind of fields. Um, particularly, there's this idea that um, the relatively humble role of the aulos in the Iliad and its kind of absence from early archaic Greek iconography suggests that the aulos wasn't at the same level as the lyre, that it might have been a later invention. Um, and I'll, I'll come to some of those points. But why archaic Greek musical technology? Um, we have some of the earliest surviving musical instruments. It's a period of vibrant and diverse movements of populations. Uh, key events are starting to form and be institutionalized that can act as catalysts for technological experimentation and adoption. Uh, and we can kind of start thinking about musical technology relative to other technologies uh, that are being developed and uh, explored in this time period. Um, what counts as musical technology? Uh, I won't dwell on that too much since you know <laughs> we're running a little late. Um, but I find musical technology from this more material side of things quite interesting because we know where it goes. We know that the sliders and the sleeves are developed on the alloy, but what were some of those initial developments that might have been made in the archaic Greek period? Um, just a, a little aside on some of the tools that we know were being used. The bow drill would have been important. This is a Roman example. Uh, and Aeschylus, uh, in a fragment from the Adonians, uh, mentions uh, the lathe, um, the pair of pipes being fashioned on the lathe. Um, so we can also infer that just from the way that these, these pipes have worked as well, but it, it's useful to think about these things. Um, I'm also interested in craft specialization, but I'll, I'll skip over that because uh, I, I talked for too long about it. But uh, does enough survive for us to ascertain the relative specialization of our loss making in this period? Are we dealing with the grand examples? And the eternal problem that high-end liars and kitherers could well be indistinguishable from high-end furniture, <laughs> which is a valid point to make and, and worth remembering, particularly this uh, object on the, the far uh, right from Samos. Um, and then from the Athenian Acropolis inventories, we have mentioned very fine musical instruments, which archaeologically, at least, are very difficult to, to point to. Um, just a kind of overview of some cautions. Um, some previous ideas um, about archaic Greece more broadly. So first of all, jumping back to this idea that the aulos is somewhat um, distanced in early Greek uh, iconography. Um, this is an important example that's often missed out by the uh, Anatalos painter, uh, very beginning of the, the, the seventh century that shows the aulos in some form of important ritual 
Lutrophoro like this are, are quite important and specialized objects. It's not just the Aulos and the Comos, uh, as we quite often see it. Again, Fraunfest are quite important for situating the Aulos as an important instrument to, as a company of musical cult and, and sacred events. Uh, and there's this wonderful example that I have to show uh, of recent work on the Pizza panels where we can even see uh, in, in this art form, which is effectively lost to us other than these four examples, the level of detail can also be quite helpful there in, in building up ideas for is this a segmented aulos in sections that we you know, have from Sparta and Paracora being depicted. Um, no, no conclusions there, but just some general ideas. I think it's also important to look outside of the field of, of music for th informing how we might approach this material. Uh, Michael Loy's um, 2019 thesis, Cambridge thesis, is great. Um, if we're thinking about how these instruments might spread into the Greek world, let's look at other technologies and how they spread as well. Are there similarities or useful comparisons? So coinage. Uh, in 100 years, this thing that completely revolutionizes how the economic world worked uh, is, spans throughout the Greek world in a 100-year period. So that gives us an idea of the scale and the speed in which technologies could spread. And I think it's important to bear that in mind with how that might be relevant for thinking about alloy. Uh, and also the, the, the process of archaeology. This is an incredibly useful table from Loy's thesis. Um, when we're thinking about the similarities between the finds that we have and the sites that they come from, we need to be aware of archaeological bias. Um, the stars on this are sites that have more than five um, project um, publications on them. And uh, there's, there's a shocking similarity between these stars, not, not entirely accurate, um, and, and where musical instruments have been found in sanctuaries. So I, I think we should bear that in mind as, as well. Um, okay, how are we doing for time? This leads us to a map of archaic Greek aulos finds. Still a little bit of a work in process. Um, green is archaic, pink is classical. There's a lot of pinks buried underneath some of the greens. These are some of the examples that I've come across. Um, but today, I'm now going to move on to a brief overview of four examples that I think are quite important for understanding the archaic Greek aulos. Uh, those from Sparta, Ephesus, Samos, and Giglio. Um, uh, one point here is that we can better redate them when we turn to the archaeological uh, publications and thinking about key things like uh, modern work on the dating of pottery. Um, it might seem a little tangential to what we're doing at, but it's really important if we're to build stricter chronologies and if we're thinking about how things are developed, um, this is important since traditionally the Sparta Aulos has been viewed as an earlier example and then later 6th century examples coming along, but I think we can merge them all in date a little bit. Um, so, Aulos case studies. Um, how am I doing for time? Okay. So the Giglio wreck. Um, I won't say too much about it, but it's a very interesting merchant ship with a vast cargo of pitch, olives, other things like that, metals. Uh, it's probably Greek, um, but we can't say that for certain. Um, uh, <laughs> there's someone in here much more qualified to talk about it than me, uh, but this is just a summary of some of the pipes uh, as they've been published in Bound, and that should be, sorry, Christophani, not uh, Christonfani. 17 wooden fragments. Um, possibly enough for nine instruments, one bone example. Three of the wooden fragments are without holes. One of these is 20 centimeters in length. So what's going on here? Um, Stelios has suggested that these are blanks, and I, I think there might be some evidence to suggest that that, that could be the case. Um, other possibilities, pitch pipes. Is this the personal possession of a passenger? This is particularly interesting because this is the, the, the traveling musician, is at least how we, we frame this. This is perhaps the working collection of a, of a professional musician traveling from Greece as a passenger on board a cargo ship. So the context here is very different, and the pipes are presumably somewhat different to those that we might find in a sanctuary context. Um, so this is thinking about technology and that side. The idea of someone wanting to travel with things that they could then work with them is, is, is an interesting idea. Um, but we should also consider what the rest of the finds from the wreck might point towards in terms of technology. Uh, there are carpenters' calipers, uh, which similar methods would have been easily used for um, making exact models of other pipes. Uh, and also the, uh, the technologies of reproducibility. On the Giglio wreck, there was a writing tablet. 
uh, and this is around 590, 600. So to what extent should we consider the possibility of musicians already at this point using written notes to either transmit technical knowledge, but also other things as well. So uh, just a few ideas and pointers that, that strike me as being important from this rec. Um, we should also bear in mind the fact that Aulos players were to a certain extent probably literate uh, when we turn to Sparta, where we have an Aulos with an inscription on it. Um, the uh, Aulos finds from Sparta were dedicated to a goddess at this point known only as Orthia. Um, conventionally, they were dated to 650 to 600, but based um, on recent revisions to the chronology at Sparta, we might be sounder off saying the pipes are probably 620 to 580 uh, BCE. So they're less, as um, Andrew Barker and Euterpe argued, an earlier kind of prototype of alloy, different to others, but perhaps closer in time and, and similar to the other Aulos finds that we get at this period. Um, there's 13 fragments reported from the 1929 uh, excavation report. Um, I've only been able to track down six of these, uh, and it, it's possible that they have been dispersed to other museums, but, but who knows. Um, interestingly, again, this is a context where we find pipes of different sizes, as in Giglio. So we get this idea that Aulites already are making use of a variety of different pipes. This makes sense, because they have a variety of different music that they need to perform. Um, I've just got a little notes on the measurements here. Um, important is that we find bone sections. This is an important development to think about if we're thinking about technological transfer from making pipes out of wooden reed and to bone. Uh, it makes it more workable. Um, from practical considerations, you can adjust the tuning. I think to get this pipe in tune, if it were orchestral, would be a nightmare with so many different moving parts that could be all slightly uh, out of tune or more in tune. Um, Read inserts in a recent article uh, by Camilla and Stefan. There's some interesting things there. At Sparta, we might possibly have a read insert. Uh, I, I, I'm not too sure. Um, and we can also see the lathe at work in some of the simple decorations on this pipe. Uh, here are some of the very, very fine uh, little in, incised lines that we get uh, being marked up here at the top. And, and here's uh, one of the sections into which a spigot would be placed. Uh, and again, here are some other parts here. This, this requires very fine machining in a way that you wouldn't necessarily have to have the skill for if you're making a pipe out of wood, because you don't need to machine things quite so finely if you're not doing spigots and sockets. Um, this, uh, I, I, I'm hopefully returning to look at it again, um, is, is, is a fragment from Sparta that could plausibly be connected to something re read insert E-ish, maybe. It has a slightly tapering profile of uh, from an internal bore of 8.6 to 7.8, so about a millimetre. Uh, and it's roughly similar to Peracora B cup, which has less of a kind of flowing uh, shape and more of a kind of cylindrical um, profile. Um, and uh, this is the inside of it on the other side. So we should also consider very humble things like reed inserts as important technological developments in the, the, the phase of the aulos at this point. It requires a certain level of knowing what size reed you're going to put into the pipe. It uh, might have been put in for allowing that uh, level of adjustment and tuning. Um, but also we should consider the possibility that not at this time not every aulos needed something specific for a reed insert to go into it, as we will see with uh, Ephesus. Uh, uh, these pipes were first published in 1908. For a long time, one of them was known to be in the British Museum, which is what this model is based on. Uh, but we now know that the other pipe is in the Istanbul Museum, and I'm putting in an application in to get that, and that will hopefully, uh, the, it's better preserved. The measurements of that will give us a better idea of what kind of uh, pitches this, this pipe produced and how that differs <laughs> to later examples, because uh, this is one of the earliest examples where we have the potential to reconstruct the scales. This is an idea of the early stage of the Naos um, that was then later developed. Uh, again, we could probably better securely date this pipe, uh, I'll just jump ahead a little bit, um, to these are the various developmental stages we see massive uh, influx of money and increasing size and scale of, of what's going on at this sanctuary during the, the 6th century and the 7th century. 
that our loss is probably from an area which we could roughly say 580 to 620, maybe a little bit earlier, based on where Hogarth found it and uh, Kirshner's work on, on the, the, the phases of this, but I, I won't go into too much detail there because it's quite technical. Um, with the pipes, though, we can say for certain, um, adding to West's work, that they are the size that they are. Um, having looked at them, they, they have clean edges. There's nothing fragmented off them. There's no evidence for a reed insert inside it. So the question then is, does the reed go inside or over? I don't think the ivory has worked smoothly enough or uniformly enough for the reed to go the outside. So we then get to the conclusion that we might have an incredibly thin reed, which is very different to the reeds that we know of from other examples. So this is to give an idea of the diversity of alloy that we might be able to find in the archaic Greek period. There are some problems to that, namely conservation work has made it less clear as to what's going on at the top of the aulos, but from what I can tell, there's nothing that would indicate uh, around this edge where you would expect to see some kind of, of work. There's, there's nothing really that gives an indication about these areas. Um, and again, we can say that it is most certainly um, ivory rather than bone, which again is an important thing, um, thinking about the trade networks of ivory, um, the Campo La Baja, Bajo um, shipwreck and, and things like that. So um, our, our lost notes and scales, what this means is, depending on how we situate the reed within this pipe, that somewhat reflects how we reconstruct the scale. Um, I defer to Stefan here, but this just gives you an idea of playing around with different reed lengths and whether they're inserted through the pipe or over the top um, and, and the, the kind of levels of interpretation that go in, into that. But either way, we find that the pipe produces some nice fourths and fifths and, and possibly an octave, so uh, it makes sense as an loss. <laughs> uh, the other pipe will hopefully make more sense of it. Uh, and again, th this is, gives you an idea that this was painstakingly reconstructed um, there's not a huge amount of internal detail about this, so presumably in the early 20th century. Um, I will start wrapping up with Samos. Uh, the, the Samos Aulos is less well known, um, uh, published uh, by um, Mustaka in 2001 in a festschrift, uh, and then uh, as part of the, the series of publications from Samos, found with a variety of interesting things, but interestingly, this is presumably a cast metal, uh, less than a millimeter thick, so this is a, an extreme level of detail and skill used to make this. Very, very different to the technologies required to make pipes out of bone uh, and wood. Um, again, at Samos, we see a huge expansion of cult activity um, during uh, the, the archaic period. These different colors are the different phases of the, the, the main altar at Samos, a site associated very closely to trade in the ocean, um, given its location. And I, I, I raise the question here that we might not actually be dealing with a Greek pipe. Um, and, and this is important to remember in the archaic period. So many votives brought to sanctuaries are things that aren't necessarily of Greek manufacture. Um, for example, uh, we have in the Egyptian bronzes from the Harayim this wonderful figurine of presumably uh, what has been interpreted as a Nubian person playing the double pipes with Bess sitting atop them. Double piping traditions existed throughout the Mediterranean world in this period, um, such as the, the Libyan Lotos that we hear uh, in, um, in Euripides. But they also coexisted alongside Greek traditions, as we see from this bronze statue on the right. However, when we get thinking about the technical sides of the, the, the Samos pipe, um, at this period, really, North Syria is one of the few places that is well known to produce bronzes cast with wool thickness of, of such a small amount. Sorry, I should have probably done a better job of, of uh, <laughs> synthesizing this block of German. Um, uh, but basically, we also find from Samos other uh, typologically Syrian um, finds, such as blinkers from horses and other things. So that's taken into account that we have another unique feature with this Samos pipe, that the holes are oval rather than circular, lends to a hypothesis, perhaps, that what we have here need not be interpreted as a Greek instrument, but something brought to the sanctuary through trade and networks um, in northern Syria, where we know there was a strong uh, double piping tradition, as there was everywhere <laughs> in the Mediterranean world uh, at this point. So uh, some concluding remarks to wrap up the hypothesis that I'm dealing with here. Um, in summary, 
um, some of the inventions that we might consider as being archaic that allowed the owl loss to run <laughs> in terms of the complexity of, of how it could be made um, and the, the specialization of that craft developing presumably from other associated crafts. Um, but I suspect that Aulos itself in the Greek world was very old. Um, it would be rash to dismiss the increased, despite that though, it would be rash to dismiss the increased presence of this instrument, both visually and archaeologically in the 7th and 6th centuries, as not reflecting some kind of increased popularity in the instrument through the archaic Greek period. Uh, to some extent, this popularity may have been borne by its wider usage throughout the non-Greek Mediterranean, experienced by Greeks going out as mercenaries and traders and as founding colonies and those sorts of things, but as well as by Phoenicians and other traders coming into the Greek world in turn. So is the Aulos part of the orientalizing phenomenon? I might argue to some extent yes, but this is to be clarified another time. What I've quietly alluded to today, though, is another factor for the emergence of the Aulos, wider structural changes to Greek culture in the 8th to 6th centuries. As Greek settlements expanded, they put more focus in developing sanctuaries. Uh, a new system of public performance developed around this. Open-air sanctuaries with hundreds, if not thousands, of citizens participating in ritual spectacles were the perfect new form for a loud-sounding instrument, and one that, through circular breathing, created an otherworldly sound, unbroken and audible to all. The diversity of the pipe's sound, not just its timbre, but its vocalization, its softness or loudness, meant that it could be adapted to the emotional needs of a wide range of settings within these sanctuaries. From here, the public world of religion, the aulos enters the dinners and symposia of the Greek world. The elite culture takes the aulos under its wing, not only because of its sound, but because it is a symbol, perhaps, of the wealth and the good life of Eastern living. Um, the aspects of Aulos technology that I have given here, um, I think should be viewed as experiments and refinements of a technology that itself was used to help explore uh, and challenge the rapidly changing world of archaic Greek society. A technology first developed over 50,000 years ago, one that we call music. Thank you. Thank you so much, James, for this wide, uh, wide um, talk with many new perspectives and uh, very, how can I say, interdisciplinary project. So thank you. And uh, questions he asked you. So. <laughs> Yes, please, Camilla. Yeah, uh, please. Yes, so about the Ephesus mm -hmm. uh, pipe, yeah. I was just thinking about a reed for such a pipe. Uh, do you think it's possible the reed could have been made of straw rather than cane uh, for such a small and fine dimensions? Because I can't imagine actually working uh, a piece of cane uh, or scraping or... Mm -hmm. Uh, doing whatever procedures we now do to... Uh, yeah, so I, I think straw could be possible. I've not thought about it. Um, but I have thought a lot about the difficulties <laughs> of how you would make a piece of cane fit into something so small. Um, uh, I, I think it could be possible. Um, uh, there are certain difficulties to it, for sure. There is also the alternative um, with these pipes we might want to consider that even though they look like they produce a melody, uh, particularly since they're made of ivory, the possibility that they could not have, they might not have been designed to be played, but could be purely votive. Um, I, I'm not entirely settled on, on dismissing that yet. I think it's perhaps unlikely, but it's, it's a possibility to consider that would perhaps explain why they didn't need to worry <laughs> about, about a reed so small. Yeah. You know, because I'm also thinking about a reed as a technological mm -hmm. development. Yes. And yeah. in the sense, uh, um, the reed seed or mm. reed insert, as we differently mm -hmm. call it, yeah. uh, it's also a sort of a technological development. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, the more sophisticated the reed got, mm -hmm. they also needed yes. some yeah. sort of, of place. Where yeah, definitely. definitely. Um, and as a parallel, there are Egyptian pipes, mm. uh, which 
probably or almost uh, for sure uh, uh, used uh, straw reeds. Mm -hmm. like they, they didn't have any sort of a reed seat. So yes, like yeah, there's, there's, there's some crazy Egyptian pipes, they're, they're teeny tiny. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah? Yes, please. Um, thank you. Felipe Nascimento. Okay, yes. So uh, I would like to ask two questions about the, you told about you told about the Tiberi music as of the talk mm -hmm. and about the, when they criticizes the music, uh, criticizes the new styles and something. Do you think that he was talking also about the technology? I mean, the new technologies that arrive at the end of the fourth century BC or the fifth century? Yeah, I, I think the two are kind of. Connected and in inseparable, almost. Um, you, you can innovate playing style to a certain extent on a pipe that has, you know, the the, the, the span of, of what, five holes and a, and a, and a, a tone hole. Uh, sorry, a, 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 an extra hole at the bottom. Um, that being said, though, when you give Barnaby the Pitna Aulos, you can do very interesting things with that. Mm -hmm in terms of going through different, uh, different scales and different pitches by bending the notes of the pipe. So I, I think by and large though, yes, technology expands what our lost players can do quite a lot, but also I think, uh, you know, if, if, if a pipe is traveling with three different pipes, is that how they play the Trimeles Nomos? And how much of a, a, a shock would that have been if an our lost player swaps his pipes halfway through a performance and suddenly changes from Lydian to Dorian. Um, that doesn't require a huge amount of technology, but kind of creative thinking. And so the, the two kind of feed off each other, I think. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, please. <clears throat> Angelo. Thank you very much, uh, James. Uh, what uh, impressed me the, was the Dactyloptomna you mentioned a, in a, um, a passage in Aeschylus. Mm. Can you please, because the, uh, the text mentions the, the drill mm. uh, or alludes to the drill. Where are we? Yes. Tornu camaton dactylotico. So this passage uh, recalled me uh, a passage of the Plutarch de Musica in, uh, in chapter 7 mm. when uh, uh, the compiler says about Stesichorus that he uh, mm, draws from Olympus mm. to catadactylon eidos right. and the armateios nomos mm. And there is um, uh, an hypothesis made by Andrew Barker that uh, the allusion in this passage was to special type of alloy. Mm -hmm. uh, have you any suggestion about the connection, the possible connection? Because, you know, the, the passage uh, the very passage uh, the compiler was, uh, is citing, is mm. recalling, is taken from uh, Glaucus of Regium, which is uh, very close to fifth century. Mm. She was active uh, from the, the end of the fifth and the starting of the fourth century. Mm. So the two, the two, uh, terms dactylotikton mm. melos and catadactylon mm. eidos, which was also uh, explained uh, as a, a rhythmical term, of, of mm. course. But is there any possibility that to catadactylon eidos in Glaucus mm. uh, could recall the Aeschylus passage? I'd have to, I'd have to look at that. But that's a really, really useful thing to to be pointed out. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think the only thing I'd add to that is that in West's Greek and uh, Greek, um, ancient Greek music, there's about four pages that just lists 
<laughs> all of the literary different names for alloy that we have. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it could, could, could be, yeah. So, thank you very much again.